Good evening. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to a rare Thursday evening session of the New York Institute for the Humanities. Uh, for the benefit of our many guests, I am Eric Banks, director of the Institute, and I'm pleased that you could all join us for this event uh, this evening, which is part of our weekly series of meetings of the Institute. We are very delighted to welcome tonight as our speaker, T.J. Clark. He is the George C. and Helen N. Party Chair Emeritus um, in Art History at the University of California, Berkeley. Clark is the author of a series of books on the social character and formal dynamics of modern art, uh, beginning with The Absolute Bourgeois, Artists and Politics in France, 1848 to 1851, published in 1973, Image of the People, Gustave Courbet, and the 1848 Revolution, 1973, The Painting of Modern Life, Paris and the Art of Manet and His Followers, published in 1984, and Farewell to an Idea, Episodes from a History of Modernism, 1999. He's the author as well as Afflicted Powers, Capital and Spectacle, and A New Age of War, which was actually uh, uh, written with a collective retort in 2005, and The Sight of Death, an Experiment in Art Writing, 2006, and a book accompanying an exhibition at Tate Britain, which uh, actually just recently closed, co-authored with Anne M. Wagner, titled Lowry and the Painting of Modern Life, 2013, a book cum pamphlet on current politics titled Por Uma Esquera Sum Futuro, which is published in Brazil. Clark's wonderful monograph, Picasso and Truth, From Cubism to Guernica, appeared this summer from Princeton University Press. It is based on the 58th A.W. Mellon Lectures in the Fine Arts, delivered at the National Gallery in Washington in spring 2009, and provides the backdrop for tonight's talk. I'd like to take the opportunity to say a special thank you to Allison McKean um, and the Princeton University Press, who helped to make Tim's visit here tonight a reality, and also to thank Tim himself uh, for traveling such a distance to speak with us this evening. Um, when I began this position a couple of months ago, I began spending a, probably an inordinate amount of time looking through the files, documenting the history of the, uh, the Institute, which are, which are really fascinating, a real treasure trove on the fifth floor. Um, one of the first items that appears outlines the, the programs that the uh, Institute began uh, following the fall of 1977 when it was founded. Um, at the time, there was a series of lectures titled the James Lectures that were given uh, several times a semester, um, and the document that, that, that I uh, have was written, I think, in 1979. The first 11 James lectures um, included such figures as Roland Barthes, uh, B.S. Naipaul, Jean Starobinsky, and a, a very young Bernard-Henri Lévy. Um, these are, I think, set of, of four or five among the, the 11 that were presented. And what really jumps out is that uh, sandwiched between Susan Sontag's presentation of her notes on uh, what would become illness as metaphor and Virgil Thompson's lecture, Music Does Not Flow, was one by Timothy J. Clark entitled The Place of Pleasure, Paris and the Painting of the Avant-Garde, 1860 to 1890, which was given on March 30th, 1978. So uh, 35 years later, it's my pleasure to welcome back to the Institute, hopefully not for the last time, T.J. Clark. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. Yeah, that document is uh, kind of astonishing, um, and I, and it is you know, very extraordinary for me to be back addressing this room. Um, I, I want to say thank you to Eric for inviting me and for Stephanie to, uh, for setting things up so smoothly, and also, of course, a deep thank you to. Alison McKean and the people at uh, Princeton. Um, just, I, I, I had to sort of decide uh, what best to do here, whether to do a sort of general introduction to the book or, 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 to, or to do a talk that in some way uh, I hope represented some strand of the book, but that had, you know, new material and new thinking in it. And I chose the latter, you know, because I thought that, well, at least some of you will have read the book and you just don't want it, you know, you don't want to rehash. Um, but on the other hand, you know, when we get to the question and answer time, of course, we can discuss anything you like and open out into all the mistakes I've made in the book in general, as well as the mistakes in the next 45 minutes. Um, the book on Picasso I published this summer tries to understand what happened to Picasso's art as he began to find cubism 
the first heroic and comprehensive style of the 20th century, a style which had so largely been his own creation, fall apart in his hands. It centers on his painting in the 1920s. And of course, I put up in front of you uh, the great 1924 uh, still life in the Guggenheim uh, collection, which uh, shamefully enough, the Guggenheim uh, uh, almost never has on show. Uh, you know, it's not on show now, it's not been, anyway, whatever. Um, um, the topic uh, earns its keep for several reasons. If you believe, as so many artists and critics have done, that the cubism Picasso and others invented before 1914 was as close as the past century ever came to a usable common language for the modern condition, as close as we come to a period style, then the process by which it became unusable by the man who'd made it, or unusable except, except in self-consuming quotation marks, may point to something about the modern condition itself. Picasso seems to have said as much. In the French version of Françoise Gillot's great memoir, she has him diagnosing Cubism's failure. Après avoir compris que l'aventure collective était une cause perdue, chacun de nous est reparti solitaire comme Van Gogh vers une aventure essentiellement tragique. The English text, which may well be primary, I mean, the publication history of this book is so peculiar, uh, but, uh, and maybe the English text came first, uh, but the text is, is actually more didactic than the French. As soon as we saw that the collective adventure of Cubism was a lost cause, each of us had to find an individual adventure. And the individual adventure always comes back to the one which is the archetype of our times, that is Van Gogh's, and essentially and tragic adventure. Risking a comparison of one's own project with that of Van Gogh has its dangers. The tragic and the solitary in the 20th century produced by artists as explicitly the condition their art will address, have most often been trademarks of or alibis for truly terrible visual work. Tragic and the solitary have been combined with the erotic, the terribleness, the ringingly false terribilita is usually just ratcheted up a notch. We'll all have our favorite candidates, I suppose, for the worst sub sub sadian showman of the last hundred years. Post-war London has one or two strong runners in the race. <laughs> but isn't and responsible by his example for much of the whole Farrago? Some critics, among them his best critics, have thought so. Picasso, after 1926 or so, writes Clement Greenberg, you'll remember, became, I quote, obsessed by a nostalgia for the monstrous, the epically brutal, and the blasphemous. And because this could only be nostalgia for scales and qualities no longer available to the artist except in the form of pastiche, in practice, his painting, says Greenberg, came to have something too literary about it, too many gestures, and too much forcing of color, texture, and symbol. By the way, the, the, in my opinion, the very great painting you have up on the screen is, um, I guess it's Dora Maar, woman uh, doing her hair, Paris, 1940. Let's leave blasphemy aside, although, of course, he, he did 
sometimes go in for it. It's the other three qualities Greenberg points to here. The monstrous, the brutal, or at least the unredeemably and maybe violently carnal, and the attempt at epic diction, grand simplifications and heroic intensity. These do seem essential to Picasso's art once Cubism failed him. Or rather, it's these qualities compounded by or discovered in an endless erotic theater. And I suppose my book is, a little reluctantly, an attempt to explain why, though Greenberg's case against the generality of work like this is one I most often work, warm to, Picasso, in my view, so often gets away with it. I begin the book, then, with two paintings from the bleak central years of the 20th century that clearly were meant as masterpieces of the new manner. Nude on a black sofa on the right there and nude green leaves and bust, both done in the miserable year 1932. And I quote a piece of writing about them that disagrees with Greenberg's skepticism, at least on the surface, more or less point by point. The, p the piece of writing, this is the interesting part really, comes from someone as deeply committed to the cause of Cubism as Greenberg, the dealer and critic Dan Daniel Henri Canweiler, who had been Picasso and Braque's crucial supporter in the years before 1914. This is the letter I quoted in the book, the letter he wrote to Michel Leris in March 1932. Yes, as you say, we, uh, we don't have Leris's letter, but you can imagine it. Yes, as you say, painting is only being kept alive by Picasso, but how marvelously. Two days ago at his place, we saw two paintings he'd just done, two nudes that are perhaps the greatest, most moving thing, things Picasso has produced. It seems as though a satyr who just killed a woman could have painted this picture, I said to him about one of the two. It's not cubist, not naturalistic. It's without any painterly artifice. It's very alive, very erotic, but with the eroticism of a giant. Picasso has done nothing comparable for many years. I'd love to paint like a blind man, he'd said to me a few days before, who pictures an ass by the way it feels. That's it exactly. We came away from there stunned, écrasé. Well, I realize that aspects of the studio chatter quoted here seem as though they're straight out of Ariana Huffington. But the tone, yes, but the tone, here is the point, is wholly out of character for this particular writer. And the verdict he produces, the judgment that the new paintings are perhaps the greatest, most moving things Picasso had ever done, the opposite of routine. Coming from Canweiler, this is very close to an admission of defeat. Eroticism plus monstrosity, it looks like, are painting's last hope. And there is something profoundly touching, I feel, for all the art world heavy breathing in the spectacle of the crisp Kantian losing hold of his cubist dream of reconstruction and falling under the spell of Picasso's satyr dance. Down he goes into the world of giants. What I want to think about in this talk is the nature of Picasso's eroticism. And the painting I'm going to concentrate on is nude green leaves and bust, which for the moment hangs in Tate Modern. I didn't know the painting well when I wrote Picasso in Truth. It only recently emerged from a cloistered life in a Los Angeles collection. Here it is under the tawdry lights in, was it Christie's or Sotheby's? I don't know, uh, fetching its 
100 million dollars plus. Small beer in the light of, uh, of um, uh, Bacon's uh, triptych on, on Lucian Freud, but however, um, I didn't know it. So it was nude on a black sofa I talked about in the book's opening pages. The two paintings, Canvila was surely right, are best thought of as a pair. I'll leave aside for the moment the question of which came first. Obviously, I don't intend to repeat what I had to say in the book uh, about nude on a black sofa. But for my approach to its partner to make sense, I have to establish two things about it. First, the painting's enactment of sex and the body seems to me to turn on the question of the nude's proximity to us as viewers. The body's closeness, its existence as a thing one can imagine touching or even entering. Its tactility, to use an old term of art. The painting on one level stakes everything on what seems at first sight an unmediated, overwhelming proximity. The nude is pressed forward towards the picture plane. It takes up almost half the painted rectangle. The right-hand edge of the painting can't contain it. But this is the first impression. Many things in the painting contradict or counteract it. The paint the picture's weird color preeminently, but also its drawing and its treatment of the space of the room. Closeness may be one moment of the body as it's pictured here, but deep remoteness seems another. Here's how my book uh, sums things up. Canviler is obviously right when he calls the painting very alive, very erotic but right also when he immediately qualifies the evaluation with the phrase, but with the eroticism of a giant. That is, an eroticism not quite belonging to the world we non-giants are part of. The remark he quote, reports Picasso making a few days earlier about the blind man and touch, I'd love to paint like a blind man who pictures an ass by the way it feels, is characteristic, not least in its lack of originality, but strikes me as leading viewers in the wrong direction. Touch, the imagination of contact and softness and curvature, is consumed in Nude on a Black Sofa by something else, a higher, shallower, in the end more abstract visuality that will never be anyone's property. The nude's near hand holding on to the claw-like white flower is an emblem of this. Fingers and petals become pure predatory silhouette. The body's pale mauve color is as otherworldly a color, as unlocatable on the spectrum of flesh tone as the yellow and the orange in the sky. Maybe in the picture, night is falling. The blue wall to the left is icy cold. The woman's blonde hair is sucked violently into a vortex next to her breast. Blacks encase her as if for eternity. The rubber plant tries to escape through the window. Which is to say, I'm adopting Canviler's strategy, of course, and casting about for metaphors appropriate to a metaphorical triumph which is to say that the picture's whole point seems to me to be that the nude in nude on a black sofa is both there and not there in the space provided. And that the same goes a fortiori for who or whatever brought her into non-being. Is the black and mauve body close to that being and to us looking on from that being's place? Or has the painting put it somehow far away? Is it touchable or untouchable, exultant or comatose, compliant or self-enclosed? 
I want to fasten for a, a minute longer on two aspects of the description I just quoted, since they are really the two main themes of my book. First, that the reality of things, the truth of things, their imaginable humanity, for Picasso seems bound up above all with the question of their closeness and the possibility of their being manipulable, touchable, a mixture of soft and solid. It follows then that the extent to which closeness and distance in nude on a black sofa are interchangeable, or, or as we used to say, undecidable, does represent for Picasso a weird turning point in his view of the world and how to represent it. His key terms of difference are in free flow. Closeness and distance first, and therefore tactility and abstraction. And this is bound up with what has happened in the painting, what, is, what he has made happen to his other key term, the room. For Picasso, being is essentially being in. An object is only fully a human possession, and therefore, as far as Picasso is concerned, interesting, by dint of belonging to room space. And by those last two words, I mean, as you'll know if you read the book, nothing very technical. Simply that the reality Picasso is capable of imagining fully is almost always contained in four walls or some synecdoche implying the four, plus a tilted floor and a tabletop with behind them a back wall, maybe pierced by a window, but only the better to establish the familiarity, the inclusiveness, the availability of the instruments or part objects up front. So again, the question occurs. Is there room space in nude on a black sofa? Are its ice wall and hellfire window tokens of room space or travesties of it, annihilating angels of anything that might really still hold and enclose and protect? The Winnicottian overtones of those verbs seems apt. For what is eroticism to be? What is caring for another to be if it has no interior to take place in? Maybe the issues become clearer if we now turn to nude green leaves and bust. First of all, for a moment, here are the two paintings again side by side. I think, as I've been saying, that nude on a black sofa is about the paradox of immediacy in painting, about the way proximity and availability and openness to possession become, in practice after cubism, something else, something colder, more abstract, more deeply perplexing. About what happens to these dimensions of experience in nude green leaves and bust, I'm even less sure. This painting seems to me to begin from the idea of distance, to begin from the idea of distance and unreality, or at least to have that idea shape the whole picture space. The idea, I mean, that eroticism is always a kind of theater with the naked body framed and confined by a flimsy apparatus of curtains, cushions, strange bands or bonds of black. Notice, for instance, that the cold blue curtain, is it colored an icy blue itself or could it be transparent to some sky? The cold blue curtain is pinned to or hung from a set of four yellow buttons. 
It's as if the scene takes place inside some kind of improvised alcove or tent. The canvas starts off from this atmosphere of elaboration and constructedness. This is the immediate contrast between it and nude on a black sofa. But where it gets to, what in the end it proposes about desire and identification and doubling strikes me as truly hard to decide. This is, to state the obvious, a darker world than that of nude on a black sofa. Darker and maybe a little more secure. Picasso is an artist I've been saying, <coughs> sorry, I've been saying, whose whole vision of life is premised on proximity and containment. So the reappearance of these possibilities in nude, green leaves, and bust is intensely charged. This picture's world is still hankering after or half pretending to actually provide the safety and enclosure of a room. Maybe even the erotic warmth, the shared secrecy behind the curtain. But the offer immediately doubles back on itself. The room space here is transparently an illusion, built, jerry-rigged, out of drapes pinned up inside some further unreadable space. And transparently, as I've suggested, is a metaphor that is materialized in the painting, as metaphors always are in Picasso if he is really possessed by them. The extraordinary blue here, well, really, there are three blues getting darker from left to right. The blue is not quite liquid, not quite airy, and not at all blue velvety and soft. It's the opposite, for instance, of the extraordinary invading forward rush of blue in the great three dances of 1925. One of the things I have to say in uh, about the blue in the three dances in my book, and I see the blue and its forward pressure as a key instance of what I want to call the arrival of untruth into P Picasso's world, is that here blue has been given a face. The blue in the upper half of the left-hand window has been outlined in red along its right profile. And it's easy to read the profile as crudely human, a blue face peering into the room. You'll notice that notoriously there's an answering black profile, a bit blubber-lipped and foolish looking, in the window on the right-hand side. Everybody agrees about that face by the way, uh, some viewers don't see the blue face in the window at left. I don't insist on it. But certainly I feel that Picasso has given the blue a face in nude green leaves and bust. And it has a little of the blubber-lipped blandness of its three dancers' black twin. Can you see it? The face is there right at the center of the curtain, like a set of billowing folds in the material, put between the weird green leaves and the weirder gray halo or aura surrounding the sculpture on its plinth. I wonder if people in the audience, once the face was pointed out, immediately without thinking gave the profile a gender. I can't retrieve my first apperception here, but I believe my present and continuing one, that the blue profile flickers between male and female, is fully backed up by the picture itself. The face might seem to be an emanation, an, an extrapolation, a, a floating out into three dimensions of the peculiar wafer-thin bust on the black marble plinth. 
And that burst, I suppose we'd intuit, even if we didn't know of the actual sculptures Picasso was engaged on in 1931 and 32, that bust is female. It is his model, Marie-Thérèse. The sculpted Marie-Thérèse looks down on the painted Marie-Thérèse. Or maybe, if we simply had the painting of the sculpture, we would think the face of the woman in plaster didn't look down. She fixed her cold classical eye on the leaves and drapery, not the exultant body below. But then the blue extrapolation comes to help us. The blue face does seem to be looking downwards, doesn't it? Gently, tenderly, is that what we think? Or is there something implacable and distant to the profile, bound up with its darkening blue color? Is the blue face female? Is it some mediating state of Marie-Thérèse herself? It's deeply linked to her. Its double S-curve of lips and nose is closer to the double S-curve of the sleeping woman on the cushion than to the bifurcated profile, nose and forehead stopping the flow of line below of the plaster head. But then the memory comes back of the profiles of onlookers that appear in paintings done by Picasso a year or two earlier. And those silhouettes seem to be male, weakly, schematically ma male, but male all the same, or do I mean even more so? Often in the literature, it's taken for granted, maybe too eagerly, that in these earlier paintings, the profiles are of Picasso himself. I don't think, finally, that the pro blue profile in nude green leaves and bust is any more indubitably Picasso than it is Marie-Thérèse. It's both. It's neither. It's the face of in-betweenness. Of course, this being Picasso, that in-betweenness is very much more than a matter of shared or distributed features. It's a matter of placement of the figure's location in space or its making of space. Compare the face in the three dances again. I would say that this on the left is the face of the outside world looking in. It's red edge flipping it forward across the window cell. It's the face of facing front, facing things, face-to-faceness. But in 1932, the face looming lazily, a little gloomily, out from the bust on the table, maybe a kind of emanation from it, seems to me the face of an even deeper nowhereness. It's neither outside nor in, neither here with us, as Picasso so constantly wanted things to be, nor out there in some impalpable distance. I believe in phantoms, he said to Canviler once. They're not misty vapors, they're something hard. When you want to stick a finger in them, they react. I don't reckon this phantom is within reach of anybody's fingers. And fingers themselves, again, this is a charged decision for Picasso, who's a great painter of hands and digits, fingers are reduced in nude green leaves and bust to a dazzling, impalpable double S curve of pure line. You see it underneath the nude's thrown back head. It's characteristic of Picasso's painting in the later 1920s and early 1930s that often Matisse seems on Picasso's mind. I think he is here. The pinned up curtains and the atmosphere of elaborate sexual artifice in contrast to the self-canceling starkness 
of the other 1932 new seem like a direct, maybe half ironic homage to the outlandish interior constructions, part Morocco, part Art Deco, that Matisse had built in Nice in the 1920s for his jazz age Odalisque. The Odalisque au Magnolia from 1923 would be a fair comparison, or the Odalisque in gray trousers of 1927. Of course, the atmosphere in Picasso is different, wilder, stranger, more secretive, perhaps more ominous. But be careful. It's not the case that these latter qualities were simply absent from the paintings Matisse did in his niece apartment. This is the Matisse paradox, that the absurd homemade Côte d'Azur Casbah did repeatedly open onto the truly unexpected. I would say that Picasso's nude with green leaves and bust is most deeply an answer to the weirdest and wildest of Matisse's interwar paintings, the figure décorative sur fond ornamental from the winter of 1926. This picture, as many of you know, has always presented difficulties to Matisse's admirers. Alfred Barr, in his great monograph, called it, in a phrase I love, a triumph of art over factitious vulgarity. <laughs> and then he added, yet because the picture is so clearly an act of will in a field of artifice, the victory seems pyrrhic. But exactly, I imagine Picasso replying, it's because the picture so fully admits, makes manifest, the fact that eroticism is an act of will in a field of artifice, that this is the painting of Matisse's that I, Picasso, most have to reckon with and know I can never quite emulate. The best I can do is replace vulgarity by transparency and sensual overload by blue glue. The cranky, absurd leaves in, Pic in Picasso our last leftover from Matisse's stifling boudoir. We might say this more generally. The unapologetic re unreality of Matisse's interior setups in the 1920s does not carry, I think, a tragic cast. Sex and art are unreal for Matisse and accepted as such. He has made a life inside their twin illusions. Je fais des odalisques pour faire du nu, he says to Terriade. Mais comment faire du nu sans qu'il soit factice? He doesn't mind if the elaborateness of his setups seems willful or fussy or even fatuous. If you know of a better world, go to it. That seems to me Matisse's message. Of course, Picasso agrees, basically, with Matisse's conclusion. He's every bit as dismissive in the 1932 paintings of all the surrounding instructions that same year in Paris that art should engage with modern life or the world of the unconscious or ally itself to the Association des Écrivains et Artistes Révolutionnaire. This latter was founded in 1932 with several of Picasso's close acquaintances involved. But the tone of Picasso's isolation is different. The cave of eroticism in his work, in his work the pinned up tent city of art and abandon, is a place of confinement, not just containment. The black bars of shadow dividing the nude's body in the Picasso only make that explicit. We might say, half adopting the language of British psychoanalysis again, that never has a naked body been divided into parts that are less part objects, less the self-sufficient, completely fixated, seemingly necessary 
and natural whole little totalities of desire. The black bands, to dwell on them for a moment, are truly an overdetermined, uninterpretable device. They make me think of Blake's infant sorrow. Uh, bound and weary, I thought best to sulk upon thy mother's breast. And I believe, incidentally, that the bands also emerge from Picasso's continual thinking with and against Matisse. A black that leaks out of its initial home in the picture and moves across the body next to it is a constant structuring principle of Matisse's work from 1914 on. The painter and model from 1916 would be a good ordinary example. Or showing the action of the black localized, as it were, dramatically happening in one specific place, the great portrait of Pellerin from 1917. Or more pervasively still in um, Goldfish and Palette. I'm sure, by the way, that this last picture I'm showing you was fundamental for Picasso. I think it's unplaceable blacks live on in nude green leaves and bust, and also come to that it's blues, and really it's whole weird reimagining of room and window. I don't think, to come back to the blacks specifically, that Picasso knew why he found Matisse's blacks so transfixing. And I certainly don't think he knew what he was doing when he turned them into the harder, narrower, flimsier black bands of the painting from 1932. Maybe the best we can do, trying to get the measure of the bands, is to see them as representations, enactments of what representation is in the act of sex. The moment of bounding, dividing, interrupting, which is always the other face of touching, fusing, possessing. The moment at which, maybe necessarily, body becomes image and convexity and concavity become abstract shape, form in the eye. Let me shift focus. The two nudes we've been looking at are date dated on the back, March 8th and 9th, 1932. And here's the moment to tell you, if you haven't already guessed, that nude green leaves and bust is the first of two on March the 8th, and the nude on the black sofa the second. Oh, lovely. Thank you. Yeah, great. Yeah. There's a wonderful final dreamscape version of the nude done a few days later on March the 13th. Here it is. But then, a month further on, on April the 14th, there is this. And four days previously, on April the 10th, there's woman with a flower. Or moving back from March to January the same year, there is this. Woman in a red armchair, January 27th. And five days earlier, this. Le repos, le repos. It's typical of Picasso that he chose to have himself photographed in front of the shrieking phantasmagoria. And also typical that two days afterwards, he painted a dream as pendant to the previous nightmare. Let me put Le Repos, finally, alongside nude on a black sofa. What I want now to fully admit and try to make sense of is the thin line in Picasso's work after Cubism between proximity and outright otherness, which in turn may mean, though not necessarily, between desirability and horror or panic. 
readers of Picasso and Truth will know that for me, one main, though enigmatic, clue to these matters comes in a conversation the artist had with Geneviève Laporte. She says around 1950 the conversation took place. Picasso has been showing her a kind of journal he kept containing a lock of Dora Maar's hair. He tries to explain. Je n'aimais pas Dora, Dora Maar. Je l'aimais comme un homme. Et je, je lui répétais, tu ne me plais pas. Je ne t'aime pas. Um, and he says, you know, of course, that you can imagine the tears that followed the, these repeated declarations. And after a moment, it, uh, this strange reminiscence provokes an extraordinary generalization. Je suis une femme, he says. Tout artiste est une femme et doit être guine. Les pédérastes artistes ne peuvent pas être des vrais artistes car ils aiment des hommes. Comme ils sont des femmes, ils retombent dans le normal. Well, here's my attempt at translating this, right? Any artist is a woman and has to be a lesbian. And of course, guine is, you know, not a polite word for lesbian either. Artists who are pédérastes cannot be real artists because they love men. As they are women, they fall back into normalcy. These are perplexing sentences. Set aside the, for a moment, if you can, the ludicrous and nasty condescension towards the pederast, and hold on to the glimpse we get of Picasso's conception of the structure of desire in representation. Representation, he never tires of insisting to the people he talks to, is desire's derivative, au fond il n'y a que l'amour. And therefore, representation is dependent on sexual difference. But the driving force of art, he seems to be telling Laporte, is its moment of identification with the difference the artist's desire for a woman, as a woman would enact, would feel the desiring. As desire for the same, in other words, as desire for what a woman already is. But always in the knowledge that this identification in representation is a great as if for the male artist doing it, a breaking of taboo on his part. Here lies the problem, Picasso imagines, of the homosexual painter. Of course, a homosexual is drawn to depicting men, this seems to be the logic, but from a position of woman that he occupies naturally, continuously, in the everyday life of desire. Therefore, the act of representation doesn't disrupt the normal circuit of fantasy, of identification and difference. It confirms it. And this, says Picasso, is bad news. It means that the otherness, the particularity, the unknownness of the object of desire is not jolted into the foreground of perception in the act of painting itself, in the act of painting itself. It means that the love object does not appear otherwise in, perception, in representation as seen from somewhere, some other subject position that only representation makes possible and then fleetingly, dangerously. Seen from somewhere, some other subject position that only representation makes possible and then fleetingly, dangerously. I think the flickering into half being of the blue looker's profile in nude green leaves and bust comes close to figuring, almost thematizing, this seeing from somewhere else. It's the figure of the in-betweenness that painting, Picasso thinks, makes possible. Maybe even the worn out words tragic and solitary could apply here. And as for the dangerousness of the image that results, well, 
don't think simply of the moments in Picasso's work of explicit apotropaic looking back of the other. The moment of dematerialization, of deep withdrawal of the other into a distance that representation can only guess at is ultimately just as unnerving. As an account of fantasy and homosexuality then, as I say in the book, the blurted sentences that made such an impression on Geneviève Laporte do smell of Paris in the age of André Breton. But as a wild theory of representation and heterosexuality, of the one's interference with the other, they have things to say about Picasso's aesthetic. I think they help us with the two nudes of 1932. The pictures are a first and second try, I believe, at imagining the other that comes into being in the space of sex. The desired and desiring body, that is, holding and sheltering itself, embracing its sexuality, and therefore addressing itself to itself and another without self-loss or abjection or mere ruthless projection of its wishes. And I'd go even further and say that in many a work by Picasso, even the I am a woman may be realized. Remember that the foiled immediacy of nude on a black sofa, the closeness that becomes remoteness as we look, comes after the elaborate compartmentalized sexual enclosure of nude green leaves and bust. The Matisse interior is imitated, then annihilated. In the painting done second, the nude is nowhere in particular. This puts everyone at risk. The annihilation of room space is as much a threat to the woman's sleeping self-enclosure as it is to our reaching out imaginatively to possess her, desiring her as she might desire herself, being suddenly in a space or a circuit of desiring where here and there, he and she, subject and object, are consumed by sheer chilling purple presence. This is hard to bear. The world is hostile, Picasso said once to Malraux. Sex and hostility will never be disentangled in his view. The armchair is death, again a saying of Picasso's which crops up in Malraux's memoir, which in this case seems immediately comprehensible. The leaves are absurd, flaccid penises. Of course the remark to Laporte that every artist is a woman could be read as just another male appropriation of the female for the same old purposes. But I think this too is ultimately a defensive reaction. I believe that the viewer is truly being invited, maybe even maneuvered in nude on a black sofa into a place where the normal to and fro and passive and active of gender don't quite operate. The body possesses us, us just as much as the person it belongs to. Hair and flower float free of their normal connotations. Nobody's fingers will ever quite hold them. Desire is not ours any longer. And that does amount, I think, to a glimpse of a better life. Please, thank you. Well, I'd like to go back. Uh, I'm, I'm, I have a big voice. And we're recording, so we do. Yeah. I'd like to go back to this, bit of, you know, this sort of mantra of yours about being is being again, and the way that this relates to what you have to say again and again about room space. In the book, you push the notion of room space toward a sort of sense of it as the um, 
basis for individuality as that develops in the West, essentially, I think, in terms of the notion of the democratic subject. And for you, you see that beginning in the uh, Dutch 17th century interiors with their uh, collection of capital as part of this idea of the development of the democratic subject. Now, what I find kind of, uh, I, I have a problem in relationship, you know, sort of relating that to the way you talk about uh, these paintings and this period at, in terms of the thin, what you call the thin line between proximity and brutality. Yes. I can sort of can't Proximity, yeah. yes. Yes. Um, you're absolutely right. I mean, they are. I, I think the, the book is about um, the way in which this commitment, right, this commitment to the interior and to the, you know, the real, the real human world being the world contained in the room, the world of room space. I think the book is about. Uh, the 20th century arriving and um, dissolving, right? You know, uh, disaggregating, disintegrating that uh, commitment on, right? That 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 assumption, right? That built-in view of what the wor what the structure of the world is like, if we are to take it seriously and also pleasurably as a human world. So, I mean, slowly but surely, and I think, you know, against tremendous resistance on his part, we find him um, e exactly painting the thinness now uh, between, um, between proximity and absolute untouchable, unknowable, uh, being out there in some space which has no shape any longer. Um, so th that becomes his subject. I mean, I think he, he's, he's constantly resisting it, right? Because, he, because I think he knows in his heart of hearts that for him, it, it contains an enormous danger that he doesn't know whether he can, um, whether he can paint without the fiction of proximity and containedness. But I think that, you know, what makes him, for me, with all his faults, with all, you know, with all, everything one says about his limitation, what makes him, for me, you know, still uh, unavoidably the artist of the century is that he, he is trying to find a way, genuinely, right, to give form to that, that breakdown of his world. Which, he's, which, which indeed he sees, right, as it's the bourgeois world, but it's the world of the individual, it's the world of the, re it's the, world of the human as far as, as far as he's concerned. But he knows it's coming to an end. I just have one follow-up, yeah. and that is, uh, what is the relationship, let's say, between room space and the garret? Yeah. <laughs> Yes, that's a lovely question, the, room, uh, the relationship between room space and the garret. I mean, the garret is, uh, it's important that he begins in Bohemia. Begins in, right, Barcelona and Montmartre, Bohemia. And he is committed to, uh, you know, I start off with that extraordinary painting in Washington, the Blue Room, which is, in some sense is a garret, right? You know, it's a painting of a garret. Uh, or it's a painting of a shit, you know, it's a painting of a broken down small room in which all of life is led and one paints and one washes oneself and, you know, one, uh, one, one brings the water up, you know, from four floors. Um, so uh, so th I, I would say, you know, that that is the emblem for me, and this is something I say, um, uh, knowing I shall provoke one or two people whose faces I see out there in the audience. Um, it, it, for me, uh, Cubism, though of course it is ineluctably the great modern style, 
which gives, you know, which, which gives birth to such endless recycling and reinvention, for me, it is also, as, as, as very often sort of period styles are, deeply nostalgic, right? Deeply, a deeply in love with a dream of 19th century bohemian belonging to the room. Now is it on? Yes. Yeah. So looking, I'm Wendy Lesser, by the way. Looking at um, these paintings that you've shown us, I think about another painter who painted naked women in a room, and that's Degas' nudes. And I, and I think to myself, the Degas are clearly a woman alone in a room. I mean, I know that there's a certain amount of criticism that has people peeking through he keyholes and stuff, but it just doesn't feel like that. They are self-contained and alone. And these two women in particular, are very much not alone. And I think that's interesting, that he, he has incorporated not only his looking at them, but his being with them. I mean, you showed the face in, in the one that has the bust, and here she almost seems to be kissing a face that is made by the outer purple of her arm. That is another face meeting hers in a strange way. Yeah. If, you, if you want to reverse that, there's very much the sense of not aloneness, but involvement with it seems to me usually a male figure. And that's an interesting thing for him to be doing. That is, he's not putting himself into the picture so much as the sense of his being there is put into the picture. And something of that seems to me to be going on with that black strip in, um, in the one with the bust. Because the black strip starts as a shadow behind the bust. It feels like a shadow there. Yeah. But by the time it gets over the body, it feels like a piece of cloth. Down at the bottom, it's very much a piece of cloth. Yeah. As if something that isn't there or is a mere reflection of another existence has turned into a real existence that's touching the woman's body. Yeah. So all, my end feeling of this is I don't have as, as frightened or as negative a feeling about these pictures as you do. They don't seem to me to be terrified about the encounter between male and female, but to be uh, attempting to explore it in a way that's kind of warm and <coughs> involved. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I, so I think I gave the wrong impression if I ended up thinking, you know, giving the impression that I, that I thought these were terrifying. I, I um, you know, I think there's something pretty terrifying about Le Repos, right, you know, and he's, the others, yeah. right? he's perfectly capable of terror, and actually it's real terror as opposed to Francis Bacon terror, you know. Um, uh, so it, when he does terror, he does terror. These, this, th these paintings are, um, I want to lay hold very much in the spirit of your, you know, your comments about that th these are meditations on the business of looking, touching, representing, painting. Is painting looking? Uh, what will painting be like if it's no longer quite sure that um, the brush, the touch of the brush can somehow or other mimic touch itself and so on, right? You know, what's proximity, what's distance? Uh, you know, I mean, uh, w why are we interested in a woman asleep, right? And the distance involved, the distance implied in that kind of self-enclosedness and so on. So, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm very much, uh, I'm saying that these paintings sort of get us into a space where uh, a lot of the cliché to and fro of viewing and desiring is put in question. But I'm not necessarily saying that that's terrible, actually. I mean, look, my final sentence was, this is a glimpse of a better life. Right? And I mean by that, you know, that actually to be, uh, to be put in mind of the strangeness of interrelationship 
um, and, and the kind of instability of the normal places and spaces of gender. To be put in mind of that by a painting is, is something wonderful. My name is Rochelle Gerstein, and I'm not exactly sure how to ask the question that I want to ask, but I feel looking at these paintings and thinking of Picasso and the great variety of paintings he made over his life, just the images you showed us of what he was making around the same time, I'm just struck by the formal considerations he has. I mean, I don't know, I mean, obviously he's always making many paintings of, of nudes, um, but it seems to me he has purple, yellow, red, red, green, as a painter, he may not be thinking, doesn't matter whether he's thinking of it or not, you're thinking about these things. It seems to me he's trying to make paintings. As you began with your uh, opening remarks, how do you go on after cubism? Yeah. One of the ways to go on after cubism is to try all these different versions of these women. Um, I don't know, I mean, I don't have the experience that you're describing uh, looking at them. I'm trying to see it through your eyes. I'm seeing it more as what is he, what is he doing as a painter who's coming out of this experience of cubism and everything else he's done and it seems to me he's, there's many themes you could do in a more formal way of what they look like yeah. that might tell you a lot about what he might be trying to do as an artist rather than our today's interest in gender and inside and outside and all the rest. So I'm curious what you think of the, his formal considerations as a, someone who's trying to make paintings. Yeah, sure. Well, um, you know, I just don't think there's an either or here, all right? That, that, that's, you know, and uh, I mean, the. Uh, and I hope that the book is really a sort of argument about the fact that um, the way to reimagine how to structure a picture, how to, how to make pictures after, uh, after cubism's extraordinary comprehensive structuring as is, is, is no longer working for you in a way which you believe in. Um, that involves, you know, a continual dialectic of form and content. I mean, it's really very, very important, I think, you know, Kahnweiler would be on your side, right, 100%. He'd be saying, what matters about painting is, is, is structure, right? The, the, the nature of, uh, of the pictorial means. Right, Kahnweiler is about as intense a formalist as you can get in some sense. Right, so 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 the so so that's why I begin with Kahnweiler of all people talking about these paintings in the way that he does. Right, of course Kahnweiler would say, "Look, I admire them as paintings, and I think they're ex an extraordinary reconstruction of pictorial space." Um, in a non-cubist way. But he also says, which is an extraordinary blurted remark coming from Kahnweiler, they're, they're not at all cubist and they're completely without pictorial artifice. Well, he can't mean that, you know, right? And I certainly don't agree with him if, you know, they're full of pictorial artifice. But, but per perhaps that's my way of replying to you, right? Is that pic they are full of pictorial artifice. But P P Picasso was not an enemy of abstraction for nothing, right? He, his constant theme is that you only can have a truly developing pictorial argument if it's an argument about you and the world, you and some aspect of the world which you are trying to fix. Yeah, so on Alpha's, Tim, I have sort of three remarks. They're not yes. quite questions, but they're reactions. In reading the book, one thing that when you, you make the remark in the book about the conservatism of Cubism, but my God, art is by nature conservative. It's made out of art. It's no astonishment to anybody who has spent most of my life dealing with historic art to think that Cubism is continue is coming out of what was. Yeah. So I don't know why anybody was sh shocked. In other words, it seems to me a problem with the construction of modernism and folk who are basically working Manet and after is that rupture is part of their notion of things. We people who came from earlier art say no, it goes on and on and the rupture is a bit of a sort of modernist invention. The next thing I wanted to say is I wondered in reading the book 
why you never use the word studio, why it's room space, and then Roz said Garrett, and then you talked about that early picture, which is one of the first things in the book. And I thought, well, that's, that's a workspace, that's a studio. And it seemed willful or méchant of you, since we're using French, uh, to avoid studio, since God knows Picasso very often stages things, the Volar suite and things are all studio uh, 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 things. And the third remark, I'm allowed to say the three and you can pick what you want to answer, is does it strike you, I mean the whole remark about sexuality and female, be, the artist being female and the reaction and the comment on, on um, homosexuality, that the whole thing is, is complex and tortured and uh, uh, twisted and very much Picasso. But does it surprise you to think, or, or it's, and it certainly doesn't surprise me, for a male artist to feel female and identify with women? I mean, that is a great thing in Western painting. It's Velasquez and the Spinners. I mean, male artists wish they were. Ad that's one of the reasons they depict women so well is because they feel at one with them. At least that's always been my assumption. I don't need to hear Velasquez saying, hey, I think I'm a woman, to get that. That is painted into the painting. So to me, it seems to me, once again, Picasso, talk about the cubism, is going along with what is deep in a tradition of Western figurative painting. Um, I'm trying to answer one and three together. Um, you know, I do, I do actually think there are moments of rupture, and I, I, and I, don't, I don't agree that always um, art is um, essentially backward-looking and conservative. All right, I mean... I didn't I, say backward-looking. I said it, in some sense it comes... In some aspect it comes out yes. of art, yes. which me yes. and, it, yes. and to avoid that is damn difficult. Yes. I mean, you can try, yes. but it's yes. very hard. That, that we completely agree on. Uh, I, I suppose that I'm really saying about cubism is that it's rather more, uh, it, 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 I, I say that it's the last of the 19th century's great, tortured, self-conscious acts of historical revival. Right, that it's trying, that it is actually trying to revive um, a vision of what constitutes the real, the real life of human individuals, which is all, which is. Yes, well, yes, because I think it's deeply under threat. Another way of putting this, Svetlana, would be actually is that, after all, it, it is interesting that. So much of, late, of the late 19th century French painting we admire uh, seem to believe, uh, following you know, the famous remarks of the Goncourt on what is happening to the interior, the interior is dying. Life is spilling out into the streets. Life is becoming public. And if we look at uh, Degas and aspects of Manet and uh, Seurat and so on, right, that, you know, that seems a sort of, that seems a sort of deep project of uh, French painting, right? That yes, painting has to enter the public outside world. That is its subject now because that is where modern life is being lived. In that sense, cubism does seem to me, right? You know, an act of, an act of deliberate uh, uh, revival. Or right, going back. Or, look, it's. I, I love the coincidence of cubism, obviously, with Benjamin's arcades project, and the fact that Benjamin, you know, is, in his way, so much wishing to insist. You know, the true reality of the 19th century was the interior. Um, and, and so there's a sort of, ben, you know, I think there's a Benjaminian strain, to. Uh, to cubism. What was the what was number two? Number two was really interesting. Um, <laughs> oh yes, yeah, studio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I think you're right. I don't know why. I don't know why I didn't use the word. I mean, I think that. Uh, no, I no, I, no. I, I think that's a genuine. I think that. I think that. Let me say this: that when Picasso becomes later. 
very, very, very self-consciously the artist of the studio, right? The Meninas period, the period of, in which the studio becomes explicitly his subject. Mm, I think something is going wrong with his art at that point, right? I mean, I think, I think that for him, what's fascinating, I think, in these various setups of the 1920s is that, yes, they may be studios, but they are also living spaces. They're, right? they're, sp they're spaces in which they're not absolute artistic setups, all right? And, and I, think, I think there's a thin line in his work, right, between accepting the reality that his world is this world he inhabits every day, which is his studio, but wishing to somehow or other have it be the space of desire, the space of making, the space of music making, the space of pleasure, the space of everyday life, of news, the newspaper, the pipe. The all possibilities of a studio? Yes, they are. They are. I guess I'm just saying perhaps I didn't use the word studio because I was accepting Picasso's premise that what counts about the studio is it's a, it's a little epitome of the world. I think I'm next. Hi, Tim. This is Chris Wood. I wonder if I could continue talking about the 19th century in Picasso for just a minute and offer a slightly different uh, proposition. Because it seems to me that the thought of many 20th century thinkers and the work of many 20th century artists and writers could be characterized as a kind of brooding on the 19th century, yeah. involving resentment, regret, nostalgia, anguish of various sorts. Yeah. And I would, if I may say, I would include you among those brooders <laughs> on the 19th century. I'm and I, no, no, I don't think no brooding here. Yes, I think you. I think you brood on the 19th century, and you're in good company, yeah. right? But I don't think Picasso was brooding about the 19th century. I think he, um, I, and I'm not saying what Svetlan Alpers was saying either that there, there was a, there was, a, the, there was some kind of continuity. I think there is rupture involved, of course, with Picasso. But that rupture is unfolding against what was for him an unquestioned background, the unquestioned framework or yeah. dispositif of life for him was the one established in the 19th century, which was anthropomorphic, it was centered, it was contained, it involved containment as metaphor for interiority and so forth. And I don't think he imagined that that would ever go away. Mm. Whereas you said that, mm. that you thought he was very much aware, very much alert to the possibility of it all disaggregating and breaking apart. Right? And I, I wonder why you're so sure of that. Because I look at the nude on the black sofa and think, uh, well, if this is a room, uh, if uh, God help us, you know, because rooms should, uh, rooms sh should offer us uh, protection, in enclosure, uh, some form of safety, some, some space which is familiar touchable, dependable. And I do think, you know, that Picasso's art, I mean, obviously, in the end, epically, in Guernica, right, is telling us that time is coming to an end. I, 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 but I certainly agree with the first part of what you're saying, Chris, which is, it's not brooding on the 19th century, right? It, it, Cubism is not a brooding art, right? Cubism is, has this sort of astonishing, elated confidence that the room is still full of pleasures and, uh, and safeties and securities and comedy, right, you know. The, the interior, it, you know, the human life is, is, is live within four walls and, and uh, we can depend on it, all right? I mean, that is very much, I think, the, um, the tone of Cubism. Um, I say at one point in the book, uh, and, and that's sort of thrown out, I hope as a challenge which people will think about and respond to, is that it seems to me very, very interesting that um, 
that in the end, collage uh, is something that Picasso himself realizes he has to abandon, even though all around him, other artists are latching onto it and you know thinking it's absolutely wonderful and endless in its continuing possibilities. And you know, after all, it never goes away either, right? But Picasso himself seems to, I say I think at some point, that he seems to believe, he seems to come to the conclusion in practice that collage cannot be, modif cannot be converted into this vision of a world in which untruth mm. is appearing. Right? Collage, collage can't, can't be terrible. Um, so he has to leave it behind. Yeah. But at the beginning, of course, right, collage is exactly wonderful because yeah. of its um, comic delight in what the new style makes possible. My name is Rob Slifkin. Um, this might start as a small point, but it's another word that I d didn't hear you hear tonight, and I don't call if you use it in the book, uh, when the, you talked about the faces and the profiles. But I often see Picasso's faces like these as silhouettes. And um, the logic of the silhouette uh, uh, infers a, a presence in front of the canvas that, that produ produces a shadow. And of course, this goes back to an earlier point that that black line seems to be a shadow. And I guess I'm thinking about this in terms of the fact, in, in terms of your thesis, that it seems that these paintings are as much not only representing a kind of breakdown of a certain room, but also projecting a room in front of them, right? There's a space yeah. um, being imagined in front of them. And, that, and I guess maybe drawing upon the, the question of their conservatism, I mean, there's a certain avant-gardism in the sense that you can almost imagine them as deterrence machines that, that are, um, in some ways, uh, I, I was thinking about the, the kind of classic modernist reading of the two-dimensional literal flatness, that in some ways they, they are, they are, these, these paintings are asserting the literal space in which they inhabit, that that, that new space becomes yeah. asserted in a way yeah. that perhaps um, we've never, you know, we, we 20, late 20th century um, viewers through Pollock know about bodying forth, but in some ways I think that these paintings are doing that and making a space in front of them. Yes, I think they are. I think that's right. Uh, but again, I mean, rather in the same, I think it would come back to my answer to your, your question, uh, which is that um, recognition of flatness, right, and recognition of the fact that, recognition that somehow or other the painting is making its space. Um, that for Picasso is, that's never a kind of formal proposition. Do you see what I'm saying? That uh, the, the recognition that actually the only space we might have is the space the painting makes. And, the, and that space has to recognize all the way through that it is nothing but artifice, ultimately flat. Um, for Picasso, that's an extraordinary, well, it's either an entirely trivial recognition. Oh, painted space is just a space that painting makes. Or it's a non-trivial recognition that uh, actually everything we inherit, coming back to Svetlana now too, everything we inherit as our assumptions about the reality of space that painting can depend on, all the means it has built through the centuries to make space real and inhabitable, to have painting be the window, the room, and so on, that, that all of this is once again absolutely in question. And it may be, it, right, it may be that we have nothing to depend on. Um, that's, a non, that's, 
that's exactly the non-trivial position that Picasso thinks painting is in, right? Always to discover, um, can, can we be somewhere in a painting, right? What's the somewhere that the painting will make for us? I think we have time for one or two more. Hi. Hi. Good evening. Thank you uh, for this wonderful talk. My name is Philip, and um, I'd like to, to ask you a question. Uh, you talk about uh, how in his career he tried to move on after Cubism, like many other artists. Yeah. And um, I'd like to ask you a question because you are a uh, Picasso expert, and I, <laughs> I always uh, how would you explain why he didn't do any abstract paintings? Uh, because in his generation, I mean, like somebody, someone like Mondrian, you know, started things that would look like kind of fauvism, and he ended up in very abstract paintings. How, how do you feel about that for Picasso? Thank you. Well, it's you know, a complicated question, actually. And um, what he has to say about abstraction is not impressive, all right? I mean, you know, it's very, it, it's, a, it's a sort of banal critique of abstraction. Well, abstraction is just formal play, and it doesn't have a subject, et cetera, et cetera, right? You know, it's very, it, it's, it's um, pretty rote, pretty rote. I mean, the, the, what lies behind that is what's the phobia? You know, wh wh what, it, what is it he's fearing? Given, of course, that time and again in his own work, you know, he, his work approaches the unrecognizable, the, right, the, the de-objectified uh, um, structure, replacing object, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What is it, you know, what's the threshold over which he thinks painting cannot pass without losing itself? And it really, in a way, that's what we've been talking about. That for, for, for him, there are certain notions about, about painting space as a model of um, human inhabiting of space, right? That that that's what he thinks painting. That's what he thinks painting is about, or or makes possible, or uh, makes makes it possible to reinvent and re-recognize. And and he seems to be in fear. Well, he he certainly seems to think that for him. Um, without the object, right, or, or, or without a kind of recognizable space world, space container, occupied by instruments and bodies that are in some way recognizable and familiar, um, the game's over, all right? You know, I, I, I can't do anything with painting structures unless um, in some sense, those structures are addressed to objects. That, that, that's the basic, that seems to be the basic dilemma. I'm, <coughs> excuse me, I'm Pepe Carmel, and I want to preface this question by paying homage to your book, which I think is extraordinary and the best thing that's happened to Picasso criticism in a decade or two. And Roz warned us many years ago that the proliferation of the biographical interpretation was going to destroy Picasso studies. Roz, you were absolutely right. And you've begun the rescue operation, I mean, of course, along with Roz's own writings that, that's so desperately needed. Um, my specific question uh, has to do with the room space that is a big topic in the book and has been a big topic tonight. You, you conclude the book more or less with Guernica and with the closing in of a different, more frightening kind of room space. And of course, 
if, if you went a few years further up to, for instance, the new combing her hair that you showed us tonight, you'd get to a very different space of, of a claustrophobic room, something that's closing in, that's sucking the air yeah. out of the space that is, seems to be about to crush the figures within it. Are there premonitions of this radical shift uh, earlier in the career? Yeah, I think there are, actually. Um, you know, I think uh, Lydia Gassman and others are sort of right about the very special moment of 1940, right? The sort of absolute terror of that moment. And Picasso's, you know, Pica Picasso's extraordinary horror of uh, the fact that he thinks he's, he's going to die in a bombing raid, right? That Guernica is going to happen to him. Uh, so, so actually, I think that the woman combing her hair is very double-edged. It's claustrophobic, and yet also it's an extraordinary, maybe we'll disagree about this, right? But, you know, for me, it's an extraordinary celebration of the body's full occupation of the room. It's, it, it, I see it as less claustrophobia uh, and, more, uh, and more that the body is so wonderful that it, it occupies all the room. The room is it, and it is the room. So, uh, so I, I think actually that the, I mean, some of the paintings are different, of course, in 1940, and you do have this tremendous feeling of sort of constriction and uh, what, what can possibly be outside the room, because one can't, you know, one, one, one can't look outside, one can't bear what might be outside the room. I think woman doing her hair is rather the opposite, and there are others from that dreadful year too, in which, again, we go back to the question of um, recapitulation and, um, and looking back, I don't, I'd see this as, you know, the last hurrah of the body completely in a space it knows as its own. Thank you.